Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Kicking It with Cal. I'm your host, Cal Denicky, and we have a very, very special guest today. The man, the myth, the legend, my high school JV soccer coach, Phil Durrett, is in the house checking in from the Chicagoland area. Phil, how you doing today? Good, Cal. Good, man. How about you? Doing all right? Um, I'm I'm really like bouncing in my seat right now. I'm, yeah. I'm so excited to do this. I you were my first guest when I created the podcast. I said I want Coach Durrett, Phil on this show, and we're we're finally here doing it. So um, so happy to have you, and I uh, can't wait for the audience to hear your story and how we met right. and go up there. So I'll start off <laughs> by kind of telling everyone how we met. So I was a 14 year old freshman in high school in Macomb, Illinois ready to get started with my soccer career right when I entered high school. And here comes Phil, my new JV soccer coach, onto the scene, just got get, re get ready to be done with college. And you came in and left a huge impact on my life um, from teaching me life lessons about how to win, how to want to be better, how to be aggressive, how to make it hot, as we <laughs> might re reference a few times today. You just had a big how impact. How to make it hot. Life. <laughs> got to make it hot. So I just wanted to share how we met and how from when I was 14 until now, you've you've played a huge role in my life. And um, I want to start from the beginning. So it's kind of ironic that you're in Illinois and I'm in Florida now, but your uproots were in Sarasota, Florida. So growing up playing soccer in Sarasota, <laughs> how did your journey take you to Macomb, Illinois, into being a Division One soccer player before you became my coach? Yeah, so, um, I mean, was pretty competitive playing all my life, you know, um, and then come high school, our freshman, or my freshman year, a new coach came in, Derek Harrington, and his son actually played at Western, so I was always, like, wanted to play at the next level, um, and Coach Harrington really, like, kind of prepared me, Derek, or uh, DJ would come down from college during uh breaks you know we would compete at training sessions so on and so forth so it was always kind of preparing me to try to play at the next level um and like I had a couple schools recruiting me um western being one of them and then when I went on the recruiting trip it was like a big family which I'm a big obviously I'm a, I'm a family man myself you know so um yeah yeah, yeah. so um it just clicked and uh we i signed um we went on a trip beforehand to germany mm -hmm. with a couple of the rookies um how many of us were there there were maybe like six or seven of us and then a couple of the johnson brothers mm -hmm. um and yeah love at first sight man you know yeah and, <laughs> and so coming from sunny florida to macomb illinois and this was in 2004 was there any culture shock when you set foot in this small town i know you said it felt like a family when you're on a team but you know you're a long way from home what were the first memories and, and what do you remember from that big jump from florida to small town illinois yeah so um i would i don't know if it's culture shock you know there were a couple differences for sure um there's not a lot to do in macomb you know it's not like a big city living you know or like a suburban living it's uh kind of country living you know there's just school football and the walmart you know and like that, <laughs> yeah yeah you laugh because you know exactly i grew um, up at that walmart <laughs> you know you know um but then like in terms of like for me personally i i went to predominantly catholic private schooling like my whole life and then going to western was like a, a little different in terms of like there was a lot more seasoning. There was a lot more uh, culture and a lot more, uh, there were other things going on, you know, as opposed to just what was going on at Cardinal Mooney High School. You know, it was kind of my sister, me, and there were only two other uh, black folks in the, at the school, you know? So it was, we were um, definitely minorities as opposed to when I went to Western and I was, I was not the minority. So if, if that's culture shock, then yeah, that's culture shock, you know, um, got my hair braided for the first time. So that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember those braids were, were nice. 
So yeah, yeah. the life of a Division One soccer player in the mid 2000s, what was that like? How competitive was it? compared yeah. to what you were used to in high school. And we know your coach, Eric Johnson, who coached me growing up because his son, McLean, was my age. Mm -hmm. What was that life like as a Division One soccer player? Yeah, we're real competitive. Um, I feel like that's something Coach Johnson was really good at, was getting, like, competitive players. Um, we all wanted to compete, and we all wanted to win, you know. Um, so, yeah, tra some of it wasn't always fun. But, like, we knew that it wasn't always fun because we wanted to be able to play our football and like our, express ourselves and be fit and so on and so forth. So like there weren't, there were times that we didn't have fun, but again, it was knowing that we were going to have fun winning. So, which is something we all wanted to do. So like, yeah, um, it was tough, but more than anything, it was mentally tough, I think, which something EJ did a really, really good job. Um, just like pushing people's mental fortitude and like pushing their mental barriers back and letting them know, like you can do a little more with your mental, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and for a lot of my students and former athletes that are aspiring to go division one, how, how would you describe the balance that you had to have between the focus on your craft as a footballer and the grades and the academics <clears throat> trying to achieve what you wanted to achieve for your education. Yeah. Um, it's important to find like, because we're all D1 athletes and we're all competing and all things of the sort, it's, we're all, we're kind of similar minded in some places. Mm -hmm. So um, like if you're struggling in a course or you're having issues with time management or whatever the case may be, like there's avenues and there are resources and you don't have to go like outside of the team, you know, you could just ask a teammate, but there are ways to improve that and help with that, you know, um, uh, upperclassmen like passing notes down, you know, so that you, you know, if you are having issues with time management, you already have someone's notes, you know, that may help, you know, um, I'm trying to think of some other bits um taking a class with a teammate is was pretty cool yeah that definitely happened a couple times taking a class with a teammate was he was takes the stress off of it a lot you know mm -hmm. um and then I mean training was always at the same time so you had to you had to move your schooling around that you know um which wasn't always easy um I had the privilege of not having too many night classes. I think I only had one or two night classes. They weren't the, the greatest. After a training session, going to class was not always fun. But, um, I mean, you do what you got to do, you know. Again, we all were competitive cast. We wanted, all wanted to play. We all wanted to compete. So, yeah. Um, and that, that competitive nature is what <clears throat> you brought out in our team, which we'll get to here in a bit. But I wanted to, to stick with some, some stories because as a 14-year-old playing on your team and those long bus ride homes and, and all the, the stories that you told, there was one in particular about your first ever practice at Western and, and what that was like to be with the guys before Coach Johnson pulled up, if you don't mind sharing. What's, what's that like as a freshman getting ready for your first training session and, and what that was like? <clears throat> yeah, it was, um, it was a little daunting for sure. Um. First of all, b before I get to, before Coach Johnson gets there, when he does get there, he, he just kind of appears, which is like a weird thing. Um, yeah, he, he just kind of like would sh be like on the pitch all of a sudden and then, you know, sc tell everybody like line up because we're getting ready for the fitness test. But um, because we went to Germany beforehand with a couple of us, it wasn't as stressful. Um, but, and then... <clears throat> You, you are you're 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 figuring it out you know what I mean you're figuring out what how you're gonna fit in this new pond like you're you're still the same fish but you're in a diff way different pond um but again because I went to high school with Derek Harrington and DJ they kind of prepared me like this this whole way um and my previous coach is the same bit you know my previous coach is the same bit they were tough um 
but it wasn't out of malice. It wasn't like, because they didn't, I, did, I, I never felt unsafe. You know what I mean? They didn't, it wasn't because they didn't hate, they hated us. It was because they loved us and they saw like potential in us and they wanted us to be like, great and to take it to the next level, you know, shout out coach, any, every one of them, all of y'all shout out. Um, so yeah. Uh, first training session was a little bit stressful, but you make it through it. You, you, uh, you lean on the ones that you can lean on, you know, and they help you through it. I think it was like that through all four years, just kind of everybody kind of helps each other, you know, to get by. That's what a leather neck is. <laughs> and that fire, <laughs> that drive, that competitiveness that you talk about. And what I remember from playing with you is something that will always stick with me. Um, where does that come from, from you? Was it something in your childhood? Was it something that you grew up with just this fire? Because the energy that you radiated was just, it, we ate it up and we loved it and we loved playing for you. But I guess I've never asked before, where does that drive and that motivation come from within you? Yeah. Um, I think as long as, as long as I can remember, I've always been like this little fire demon competitor. Um, the firefly, the firefly, you know, yeah, you know, um, but like speaking on my coaches again, one of them told me when I was little, like you you can be bad out here. Like you have to be good. If that makes any sense, like you have to be good. You have to be able to compete at a high level and do all the little things that are required of competing at the high level. But like, you can let the little demons out. That's exactly what he told me, coach Craig, mm -hmm. you know, he said, you can let the little, you can be bad out here, but you got to be good. So I took that to heart. I really did. I have difficulty playing today. Because like in my brain, I'm supposed to let my little demons out. So like, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I don't know. It's it's uh it's instilled in me. But again, I took to that. So I just have always kind of competed with that attitude. Um, and it, people call it like a try hard or whatever the case is, you know. But I just call it a competitor, you know, at every level, whatever level. Yeah. And every practice you had us competing, whether it was doing the fitness test, running 10, 120 yard sprints timed. I remember like actually being scared going to practice thinking <laughs> this man is going to make me pass out. And, you know, we had to pass the fitness test for you in order to play. And it was just, it was a daunting feeling for me. I mean, I was probably the smallest guy on the team and I, you know, you got to be fit to play soccer. And that that test which came from western um, yeah is just something that i'll never forget and and after it was over it was fine but in that moment it, i think leading up to that day i was like this is going to be the worst day of my life but not only the fitness test we i think we played rugby in practice one day just to get that fire and that drive out of us so whoever had the ball you were <laughs> going after and trying to tackle them and you know we were we were doing unorthodox things which i think i loved i mean it wasn't yeah. just ball on the foot every day we were we were doing things that you made us want to become better better players for it and I think your freshman year of high school I know for me is is like the make or break year so I think a lot of people play sports their freshman year and then they decide from there is this for me or is it not yeah and, what direction mm -hmm. and luckily for my class and that freshman class most of us stuck it through and played all the way up until we were seniors. I think 10 of us graduated together and, and all played together. And that was really cool to see. And, and how you motivated us was, was, was super fun. So fantastic. Um, yeah. <laughs> Respect. Um, what is something you've learned when you coached my team, that JV soccer team as a young 22 year old college kid coaching 14, 15 year olds, what, what was a lesson you learned from that fall? Because it just stuck with me so much. Yeah, this was, this was, uh, when you sent me the questions, this was a tough one. This was the toughest one, I think. Um, um, but I, I think specifically for your group, again, we got a little bit lucky because you guys were around for a little bit. McLean was in the group. He had been around obviously for a bit. We had seen some of you lot at like some of the, um, camps or whatever it was we were doing and things of the sort over the summers or in the spring or whatever it was 
So like you guys were, you guys wanted to be successful, you know what I mean? Um, and then, so like for success, you need people to buy in, you need the players to buy in. And I think there are a number of ways for players to buy in, but like for your group specifically, because you had seen me before, because you had some players who wanted to compete at the next level, um, like it was a lot easier. And then my, my voice wasn't foreign. My voice wasn't foreign when I ran up on you guys and was screaming crazy things. Like you guys were like, okay, they just won a championship last year. You know, like they did it twice, actually. No, they did it three times, actually. So like, maybe we should listen to some of this stuff if we're trying to get to that next stage so we can be prepared, you know? So like, yeah. Yeah, I think it make it hot. You make it hot. <laughs> it reminds me of just this theory that when your best players are your most motivated and are the ones that are leading the bunch, there's no room to slack because <clears throat> they're setting the standard. And when your best players are a little bit more lazy and, and don't take it as seriously, I think those are the teams where Suffer. You, you underperform. And so uh, I like that you said that because we, we did grow up playing together. We did go to Western camps. Uh, we were familiar with you and Coach Johnson and Coach mm -hmm. Moore and the philosophies of what um, we were trying to do at that time, which I think was great. But it's just kind of crazy, like 15 years later, kind of hashing it out of what that was like because we were both obviously in different points of our life. And uh, I just think that's that's fantastic. So my next question is, and this could, you know, you could go any direction with this, but do you realize the impact that you make on people and, and especially myself, because it's been a huge impact. And what does that look like in terms of coaching young kids and the impact that you make? And when, when might you see that um, like come to fruition in your life? Yeah. Um, so like when you're in it, it's a little different. And we only had a year together, so you, you don't necessarily see it when you're in it. You know, it's like when you're raising a pup, you know, you kind of don't see the growth unless like you go away for a long time or you see them with somebody else or whatever the case. And you're like, oh, OK, that's we, we worked on that. You know, we worked on that. Um, but there were definitely times, especially coaching for Synergy, there were definitely times where like the kids would say stuff. And I would just be on the sidelines like, oh, man, they they heard me say that at practice. And now they're just screaming. And like the parents think it's hilarious or like it's, you know, it's it's funny or it's embarrassing, whatever the case may be. But like, yeah, there were there were definitely times um, where it was it was like a parrot moment, you know, or they're screaming out something that they heard me say, which is which is good, which is good. Um specifically that the team I'm talking about, that Synergy team, they, they went far. They competed at a couple uh, state competitions, a couple, a couple national competitions. So like, yeah. Um, I, I, and I told them it's going to show up, you know what I mean? Like that attitude and that consistency and that type of training and that mentality. We talked about that earlier. Um it's going to show up later. And then it, it did, you know, like in their junior and senior years, they were able to compete. Um, I think what was a governor's cup. I, I'd have to, or it's not governor's cup. I'd have to double check what this tournaments were, but yeah. Um, I think that's cool. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's cool to work on something when you're really little and then be consistent. And then it, you get to the point where it's time to compete. It's time to try to win. And you, you're able, you have the capability to jump up and win a header and to someone's feet. And then that person is able to connect a dot because they know that you're going to jump up and win the header and so on and so forth. I was going to say that about your group. Like, it wasn't always the best players that were um, the most successful. It wasn't always the best players that were most successful, the quote unquote best players. It, it, it was usually like the dogs, the grinders, the ones that were willing to push the piano you know and 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 that's how we had success we went undefeated that season where where do people do that at you know what i mean like and it's just because again because of the mentality and like because we had a couple of special players we had a lot of people that wanted to push the piano that wanted to like have success 
So yeah, your group was cool. Your group was cool. My my first synergy group was like kind of like that. It was cool. They they like bought in. They um they like believed in the things I was telling them, you know what I mean? Like Like if I would have told you, Cal, like go climb on the top of this building, jump off, it's gonna help the team. You would have been like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, what time? Like, yeah, yeah. Like what time? What time? And I was the same way. Like I was that type of player, you know. Like if Coach Craig was like, "Yo, Philly, you got to go. It's gonna help us win this game this afternoon." I would have been like, "You want me to jump forward or backwards? Like which? Like, but that's the trust I had. You know what I mean? Like that's the trust. So." Right. I, uh, in my coaching experience, I always bring it back to my eighth grade group of boys basketball that went to state my eighth grade year or their eighth grade year. And it was a group that I always say would just run through a brick wall for me. Like they were doing each and everything Mm -hmm. that I asked them to, they didn't ask questions. They didn't complain. It was just, it was just so fun to work with and see growth over three years, which I think was the most rewarding for me. And I want to give them a little shout out because I actually flew back to Illinois uh, to Lincoln to watch those boys play football. So I had them in basketball, but they ended up um, becoming high school football stars. And my guys, Keon and Kanai Carson, broke a 37 year drought at that high school for not making the playoffs. And so get it. I was there the night they clinched and it was jubilation. It was it was like yeah. Christmas Day and, and just looking up at the energy in that crowd to know that a couple of the boys that I spent a lot of time with um, brought so much joy to that town. It was so cool. So I want to give them a little shout out, but uh, yeah, respect. respect. You mentioned uh, you said Philly earlier, and I wanted to talk a little bit about nicknames because I've always been a believer in using people's names and how important it is. And when someone hears their own name, they, they just, they get excited and mm-hmm. feel what happens in class sometimes is I'll be, trying to talk to a kid and I'll see that they're dozing off a little bit. And 99% of the time when they're dozing off, I'll just boom, mention their name real quick. And every time the eyes just boom, yeah. go straight to me. And it's, it's this trick. And if people don't know, like use people's name, don't overdo it, but sure. you use someone's name, lets them know that you're genuinely interested in the conversation. But for us, it was nicknames and, you know, yeah. you called me Ripken because of Cal Ripken you know, everyone thought saw McGraw. We all had nicknames. <laughs> where where did that come from? Your oh, ability Thaw, to Saw create McGraw. great nicknames. Where did that come from? <laughs> um, the nicknames, I think from Coach Jerry from a young age. He had like nicknames for all of us. Um and then like you said, it just it makes you feel like important, you know, like when you're running down the pitch and you hear Philly cheese, you know, like <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know what time it is. When you're when you're running down the pitch and you hear Ripken make it hot, like you know what time it is. You know, you don't. There's not very. You don't need more words. So it's, yeah. Um, I think that comes in the training as well. You know the the um, importance of the nickname because again, you can just call on them. So it's it's. I don't know. It's like a, it's like a secret weapon. It's like a little uh, code. It's like an unlock. You know. It is. Um, it's that. It's that turbo in Mario Kart. It's the turbo in Mario Kart. Yeah. Like I've uh, I've created a few nicknames for students this year, and you can just see the smile on their faces. Like for you sure. definitely want to like you know at first be like, is that cool that I call you that? And then as long as they're cool with it, just roll it, with it. It's even better when when their mates start calling them the nickname, you know, and that mm-hmm. carries on forever. Then it's like, okay, here we go. Now now they uh now they can enjoy it forever. You know. Hopefully it's not too uh. Nothing too crazy. You know? Yeah. And uh, it's funny you mentioned that because a few of my hometown friends from Macomb still call me Bibby. That was my nickname since like yeah. fifth grade because, you know, I was a huge Mike Bibby fan. And, <laughs> you know, I'll still go home for Thanksgiving and a few times a year and, you know, I'll select a few people and just they just don't know me as Bibby. And like mm-hmm. if some of my friends in Florida were to hear that, they'd be like, Bibby, <laughs> who is that? So it's crazy how things just stick with people and, and those names pretty mm-hmm. much live on forever no i know for a fact i've heard those boys call you bibby for sure <laughs> for sure when i was coaching you and like recently for sure for sure yeah and i'll share a quick story because it was always bibby and then i had one practice in seventh grade for basketball 
where I just went off and I had the best practice of my life. And uh, one of my buddies looks over and goes, man, I'm going to start calling him Bibby magic. Cause he is just magic <laughs> at this practice. So it, it turned from bibs to Bibby to Bibby magic. And I don't hear it a lot nowadays, but occasionally I do from my hometown friends. So it's, it's pretty cool. Oh, see, and it's, it's important. You know what they know what time it is, you know? That's right. So kind of moving on from your, your coaching career after you left Macomb, after you left Western and, and going up to the Chicagoland area, kind of what, what's coaching like now? And I know you're in the club scene and have been doing the club scene for a while, but just kind of share what your journey's been from after you graduated college and the last 15 years of coaching all these kids. Yeah. Um, I'd say a lot of the same. It's a little different coaching in the high school realm versus like the club scene. Um, just interaction I, I was also the JV coach so I didn't have to deal with like a lot of the head coaching bits and pieces um so but in terms of um like dealing with kids they're they're dealing with different things like we kind of talked about this a little bit you know um but I, I think if you're consistent kids are really malleable you know and they they want to like improve they want to i hate to say please people but um they want to um i yeah i hate to say please i don't i'm not certain what the term is but they, yeah you know um, maybe just do what's right they want to do what's right you know if someone that they admire they see somebody who above them is successful or is having fun or whatever the case may be and they want to emulate those things and then that person is telling them to do these sort of things like they want to accomplish those things so again kind of getting back to the buy-in bit you know um like if you get the kids to buy in you, you can have a lot of fun mm -hmm. you know and then and then you can disguise like things that aren't fun by letting them know, okay, I, I recognize this isn't fun, but like, we're going to get through this bit so that we can have fun and then we'll have success and then um, so on and so forth, you know? Um, and if you're consistent in that and you're like um, disciplined in that, like the kids will respond, you know, the ones, the ones that want to respond will respond. And then, yeah, you can, you can go further there are times you can go further with less because they're, they are willing to push more as opposed to you have more, but they're not willing to push as hard or like train as hard. It's a lot in the training. It's a lot in the training. So yeah. Um, no, and I've been blessed. That. I've been blessed in that regard. I think I really have, like I've had some good, good groups, some good, good groups. Um, that we're willing to compete, you know, um, willing to wake up before school to go to training, you know. Um, and I feel like that makes all the difference. Like if, if you have a group that buys in, makes your job a lot easier. You're not fighting them to try to sure. compete. They want to. And that it, I think everything just goes a lot more smoothly in that case. So For sure. We're going to wrap things up, but there's one thing that I like to do to end my podcast, and that's called One Thing on Your Mind. So what's on your mind, Durrett? Is it a movie, a, a TV show, a book you're reading? What's something you want to share Share with the world about well, you know, what's going on in your personal life that you're into right now? Um, what's on my mind? Um, I'm big into bonsai at the moment. I got a lot of uh, bonsai trees and... Uh, I've been growing them from seed. We're going on year two now. So it's pretty exciting. I flip them every day. Just out in your backyard? No, up upstairs. I got like a little bonsai zone. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you some pictures later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's all right. It's all right. That's you know, cool. I'm working on it. Uh, that's awesome. For me, I'm trying to learn how to golf right now. And it's such a, a tough thing, man. I'm, I'm, I'm paying for lessons and I'm feeling good when I'm there with my instructor. And then as soon as he leaves, I'm hitting it right in the water, right to the right. It's just, it's tough, but I want to learn. I, I feel like you can play until you're old and uh, you, uh, you get lessons. You get lessons. Yeah. 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 And uh, 
being in Florida, you can golf December, January, you know, but like it's endless summer. So I feel like it's going to be a good investment for me to, to try to get into this golf world. For sure. For sure. I, I know you wanted to wrap it up Ripken, but I had a question for you, mate. I had a, yeah. uh, hit me. What, uh, how was, what was your experience like that freshman year, you know, coming in as a newbie, you weren't the best, you know, um, there were cats like, um, McLean, um, KJ, that, uh, what was the homie's name? Vasily, the little wild Russian, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, so yeah, like what was like, how, like from front to back, I've least like, you know, again, 15 years later, you can look back on it and say it was successful. It was a positive experience, but like when you were in it, when you were the puppy, mm -hmm. like what? So I love that question and we'll go as long as we want. We don't, yeah, we don't yeah, have to yeah. end with, with uh, you know, one thing on your mind. From my experience, I didn't play soccer as a young pup like most of my mates did, as you like to say. I love that. <laughs> um, I, I, I played a little flag football, a little tackle football, and then in seventh grade is when I started to, okay, I want to try to do a little YMCA soccer. Did one year of travel with the guys, and when I did that year of travel in eighth grade, it was on. We were, mm -hmm. we were obsessed with Ronaldinho. Mm -hmm. We were obsessed with – going out every single day in my backyard and I would just juggle a ball in eighth grade every single day. And Vasily would come over and him and I would just talk about, you know, Coton and Dane and mm -hmm. those guys who were seniors. And we were just like, we want, we want that. And, and him and I would just compete every day. And, and, and they had success, right? Coton's group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they went to a sweet 16 when we were in eighth grade. So we got to see them, you know, right before we entered high school, make some noise in the yeah. IHSA playoffs. So we really were like, that's going to be us. Like we have, we have the guys to do that. So going into my freshman year, I was, I was really ready to compete. Um, if you would have told me at the time that I was, you know, on average or maybe a little bit below like skill wise, I would have agreed because, you know, I, I was tiny, a little slow but I knew the game and I felt like I was smart. So mm -hmm. uh, you kind of saw, you kind of saw your freshman year, a couple of the guys maybe play up or get invited to play a little varsity. And, and I remember just that year thinking like, I'm just having fun with my friends. Like we're undefeated. I have a great mentor in you helping me out. Um, I just had so much fun. There was really no, worries in the world um i wasn't thinking about where is this career gonna take me am i gonna get to play varsity like no i was just having fun with my friends and i just learned the the life lessons of what it's like to compete uh -huh. and play hard and work for what you've got so um that freshman year it, it built the foundation for what was to come in, in the rest of the four years that i played so by the time we were sophomores that's when people start to separate themselves we probably had two or three guys start on the varsity team and when i wasn't getting a lot of varsity time as a sophomore that's when i started to feel that burn and that desire like i need to step up if if the kids my age are playing then i should be too mm -hmm. and it, it was more of a size and strength thing i remember talking to coach Moore and, and asking him like what do i have to do to play i think i started two games as a sophomore and um he just said you, you know you, you gotta you gotta train you gotta get in the weight you gotta hit the weight room denicky and and that's what I did. And then started my junior and senior year. And we, we had success. We didn't um, necessarily end my senior year the way we thought we could have. I think we could have yeah. went a little bit further. Mm -hmm. I told you that whole story about mm -hmm. four red four red cards in the, our last yeah. game. And just uh, not a great way to go out. But the foundation was built my freshman year through you. And I that group was just great to play with. Like I said, we had 10 seniors end up finishing out our high school career and that's pretty unusual for a small mm -hmm. school you mm -hmm. might have you know three four five but for 10 of us to go through um it was pretty cool and then to see after we graduated the team continued to have success it was it was cool and uh, i i want to thank you for building what thank what you. that foundation was so that that was my experience i mean i was more into baseball more into basketball soccer was my my third sport but um, you know, this podcast name kicking it with Cal, there's a little that kicking it, you know, stems from what you inspired in me at a young age with soccer and, 
it'll always go with me. And, and I still like to kick the ball around every once in yeah. a while too. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> respect, Rifkin, respect, man. Yeah. So, um, I, unless you had any other questions, uh, I, I think we're all good here and I appreciate your time and we'll make sure to get this out to some people who I think would appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate your time, Rifkin, man. Hopefully you, uh, we uh, link up soon when you come back in town. Yep. I'll let you know when I'm in Illinois. So take For it sure. easy, Phil. Have a All good right, one. Bro. Peace.